Well, here we are in our life on mission, and we have but one job, right? It's to be a witness, and I've kind of enjoyed Pastor Mike when he's had those, those pictures up there. You know, you got one job, and you blew it, you know. Well, it's kind of fun to laugh at other people, you know, and their big mistakes, but I thought it might be good just to kind of see how we're doing on our one job of being a witness here. So if you brought somebody in the last six weeks to worship, raise your hand. We want to shout you out. We want to applaud you. We want... Yes, Joyce has. All right. Now, okay, now I know that sometimes the invitations, they fall on deaf ears. I get that. But what about the other things? You know, our, our life on mission, being a witness, and um, it, have you invited anybody into the backyard yet? Now, you know this isn't just like literally your backyard, but you know, you're, you've intentionally done something friendly to connect with somebody. Anybody done something intentionally friendly? Okay, see, I knew there'd be more hands with that one. Okay, now what about, what about inviting them into your house? Now, it doesn't literally mean maybe in the house, but you've served them in some way. So, anyone? Yes, yes, okay. Now, here's the big one. Here's, here's the big one. Have you, in your own words, in your own way, shared your faith about Jesus with someone? Okay. Wow. That's awesome. All right. Now, you didn't know there's going to be a test at the end of this, did you? Okay. But, the, yeah, that, I just wanted to kind of take our picture of our, our one job. And um, if, if you have taken this series to heart, this life on mission, and, and you've, you know, taken it to the place like, okay, yeah, I, I want, I'm going to do this. You've made a commitment in yourself. And, and many of you have. For those of you that have, you have learned something almost immediately, right? You learned that, ah, that I do not have within myself in this, this one job of being a witness, I don't have everything that I need. You know, and it's not a matter of training. You know, it's like, oh, if we just had six more weeks of training, I'd be doing this, right? Because this is not rocket science, is it? I mean, it's being nice to people, right? And then serving them in some really small way and then sharing your faith however that is that you do it. Right? I mean, this is not complicated. And yet, for those who have really said, yes, I, I want to do this and... and have taken some steps, you have realized that you need more. Now, sign language for more is this. So let's all do it once. Okay, I need more. Thank you. All right, more. And a constant supply of more because my human resources are quickly derailed and distracted. I like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be doing this, and I didn't remember again, and I'll try, you know, oh, yeah. And, and, and I... I come to that realization myself that I need more. Now, the problem with realizing that you need more is that, um, in our culture at least, we just assume that that more is going to come from ourselves. You know, and then you get the big guilt trips. Like, oh, okay, I know I'm supposed to be doing this. I know this is of God and this is good. And I just, I'm going to have to really try. But in, in every human endeavor... And in all human resources of time, there's only so much time. There's only so much effort and, and skill and wisdom and kindness and service that we really have to offer. And, and it's never, ever going to be enough. We're, we're always going to need the more. And what God does for us is that he throws out this lifeline of prayer. And he throws it out to all of us who are kind of just barely making it and knowing that we don't have enough real strength to do much more than what we're doing right now. I mean, who could add much more to their, to their uh, agenda and their calendar? It's like, oh. And, and God throws this out of prayer. And prayer is really for all of the clueless and the hopeless and the helpless, and the people that are literally at the end of their ropes. And it is 
here that God extends to us an opportunity to receive more through prayer. As we then realize that there are people that are so dear to our heart that we, we do lift them up in prayer and we, we come to God and we say, Lord Jesus, I really, really want my children and I really want my grandchildren not just to know you that they've been to a church and not that they have a membership somewhere. Lord Jesus, I really want them to have in their heart you in which you're just everything to them and that they would never, ever think of having a life without you. And that prayer then extends to a spouse and, and to our parents and, and to our neighbors. And finally, we realize it's just huge. There's just so many people, Jesus, in other nations and, and, and people that I'll, I'll never talk to. Jesus, I need more. And it's there in the prayer, in this lifeline, that God extends to us that those who ask, receive. And those who knock, the door is open. And those who seek, find. In fact, Jesus would have us take such confidence in these words to know that <clears throat> in prayer that it's more than just a lifeline, but it is the way of life on this mission. To actually believe them and, uh, that he would compare, set side by side, a human parent. You know, there's some really bad parents out there, right? I mean, there's some parents like, whoa. And, and, but Jesus would say, even someone like that, even somebody's like, wow, uh, compare that person <clears throat> to your heavenly Father and in, even as evil as you are, you know how to give good gifts to your children, right? So that as you compare side by side us marginal parents with the best parent of our Heavenly Father, you know that if you're asking Him in prayer for bread, that God isn't sitting up there so annoyed He's going to give you a stone. And if you're, if you're praying for the resources that you need, we need a fish, God. He's not going to send you a scorpion or a spider. Even you know how to give good gifts. How much more your heavenly Father. That's the reason James could so confidently write, is somebody having trouble? Well, let them pray. Is somebody sick? Oh, well, let's gather everyone around. Let's anoint them with oil because those prayers of the faithful will be heard by God and they will be answered. That person will get well. Oh, um, did you not know that prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective? So as we think about prayer, as we hear what God says about this lifeline, that it truly is powerful. It's not powerful, though, because in and of itself, like, well, I prayed, now it better happen. It's powerful because of the one to whom you pray. He is the one who has invited us into this very dear and close relationship that he actually cares about what you say. So Jesus reminds us not to, it's not some special words that you say, you just keep on babbling these words to God and somehow that he just wears, it, wears them out. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to give you what you want. But God actually cares about your life and what you want. He cares about the people in your life and your community. Now, you may not know this, but did you know that God has actually changed his mind because of some prayers? I know. I, it's, it's, obviously, it's not the rule, it's the exception, but hey, it's there. And I can come up with at least four without even thinking about it too hard. Now, the reason that God changed his mind is because what you want matters to God. The cry of your heart is a cry that he listens to. Now, there are four people, and the first one is Abraham, right? Remember, God came to him, and he said, I'm going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham's like, whoa, what if we find 50 people there, right, that are righteous? Oh, because you've asked, I will not. If we find 50 people, we'll save the city. Well, what if there's 40 or, or 30 or 10? Okay, what if we can just find 10? 
God changed his mind. If we find 10 people, no problem. Of course, they didn't find 10 people. They found four and only three made it out, uh, Lot and his two daughters. And, and as Lot is trying to run away from Sodom, he's an old guy, he just can't make it. He says, Lord, here's a town. It's just a little village. Can I, can I make it to that town? You not destroy it. I know you're going to destroy this town, but can, I, can you save it just for me? And God said, yes. Changed his mind. Of course, the big one, we're talking like all-star change his mind, is Moses, right? In the Bible, it says that God repented, completely changed his mind because of what Moses asked. God's like, I was going to do this, but because you said this, okay. Hezekiah. You may not know King Hezekiah that well, but God sent him a word to the prophet, uh, through the prophet, and he says, pack your bags, get your fares in order, you're coming home. And he's, he dropped to his knees and he's praying, Lord, please, just a little longer. And God listened to the desires of his heart and gave him 15 more years to live and told him so. It's amazing. Certainly the exception to the rule. But I, I think that God gives us these examples so that we do not lose heart in our prayers, as if, you know, God's just going to do what He's going to do, so why even bother asking? We bother asking because we're in a, a relationship with someone whom we are taught to call our Heavenly Father. We ask because what we want actually matters to Him, and at times, that will be what is done. Of course, as Jesus teaches us to pray, He teaches us that the best course is to align ourselves with the will of God. To let God be who He is. He's God. Which means at times that uh, there will be no. Sometimes that will be the answer. And sometimes it means no, the disease will continue on until death. And sometimes it means no, the pain will remain. And sometimes just no is no. But in the life and experience of Jesus, we find that even in the no, that is the very best place to be, that the will of God is done. For Jesus, being in this very loving relationship with His Father, there facing the cross, its suffering and its cruelty, Jesus drops down and prays for more. More time. More ways. Is there any other way than this cup of suffering? Jesus prayed three times to His Father this very same petition. But He placed Himself in alignment with the will of God, knowing that even if the cross is the final answer, that it will be the very best for Him and for all of humanity. He entrusted His body, His life, and His soul to God His Father, trusting that His body would not see decay, that He would be raised from death on Easter. He trusted His Father that it would be the very best for all humanity, that here suffering and dying and shedding of His blood would be the covering that all humanity would need for your sins and for mine. So that as Jesus taught us how to pray, that to place ourselves in alignment with this will of God is a very good place to be. So that when you pray, say, Father. It is the will of God that absolutely everybody on this world, in this world, that when they pray, and almost everybody prays, that they would pray to the one who has created and loved us and call him in this relationship Father. And that as they call him Father, it is God's will that this relationship be so rich and so important that this name of Father be hallowed in each and every person that it be kept respected and in awe and that nothing be done to ever disrespect or rebel against this name and this Father whom loves me and whom I love. Jesus taught us that the very best place to be 
is in line with the will of God that his kingdom keeps coming and coming and coming. That every tribe, nation, and person, your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, and all people come into this kingdom of his forgiveness, of his love. It is a prayer to be aligned with the will of God that all of our daily needs are supplied. And that every sinner finds forgiveness and that every heart becomes more and more like God in being and giving this kind of forgiveness. That there would never be in any heart a hardness that says, well, I cannot forgive you. I cannot be around you until you change. That it is God's will that we be delivered out of hard testing and from evil itself. You see, all that we would want and would desire that God would change, it's all in the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. It's all in the relationship. You see, our life on mission really is a life of prayer. In fact, I can think of no other life with God that does not have this conversational um, through each and every moment of day in which I pray. And so I ask you, well, how is your prayer life? Have you been convinced, like James, that your prayers are powerful and effective? Are you someone who would trust in this relationship with God that as I pray over the sick, that God in His time and in His way will make them well? Are you so trusting of God to let Him be who He is, that your way is best and that I only want your will done, not mine, and yet I know that you care about what I want and so I'm going to ask but I'm still going to put myself in a position that you will be done. Or have your prayers become kind of rote or small or simply asking for things? Or have you just kind of given up asking because God's going to do what He's going to do? As our life continues on mission, I invite you to repent, to turn and believe that God, your heavenly Father, desires the utmost best for you, has given himself, has thrown this lifeline of prayer, invites you into this partnership of prayer, knowing that they, those petitions are powerful and effective because of the goodness and the righteousness of Jesus who is with you. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you. Continue to teach us. Continue to lead us in a daily conversation with you to trust you. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our faith.